almost immediately, here is kind of where I start to have a little bit of trouble with the EMS side. Welcome back to Heroes Next Door. Thank you all for subscribing and watching the videos. Today we're going to do a little reactionary video in regards to Chicago Fire once again. This is season seven. This is in regards to a bus accident. There are a lot of things that go on very quickly here, so we're going to break it down a little bit at a time. Let's we'll start in the beginning. Right from the beginning here, you got the rescue and the engine showing up, a bus right into a holding area for patrons. Chief does a walk around, do a complete scene size up, and he immediately recognizes there's someone actually stuck underneath the bus. Very good work. He starts delegating responsibilities here. So from there, the captain starts telling his crew what to do. It, you know, get the airbag, get the cribbing, stabilize the vehicle. So the delegation of responsibility. Chief did the walk around, figured out what's needed, gave the captain something, gave the lieutenant something to do, and they started right to work. EMS arrived on scene, and here's where I really like it. The EMS personnel immediately calls for, we call it an EMS box. So they call for multiple resources, maybe two or three more ambulances, maybe the trailer that has mashed casualty backboards and stuff in it. She immediately knows her job and does it well by getting those resources in route. Whether you need them or not, you don't know. Meanwhile, her partner starts doing her triage. She did a rapid triage. She says, all those that are you know, relatively uninjured, come over here, we'll get to you soon, but they're gonna start working on those injured patients. Perfect, absolutely perfect way to do this. So once she starts calling for help, fire guys look underneath, see the victim, and we have two major victims. So in this situation, they divided their crew. One crew goes underneath the bus, start taking care of that patient, while the other one starts assessing the driver who actually caused the accident. And the reason for this accident for this episode is she's having a seizure. So it's a critical patient, but can you get to that patient right away? And which one do you choose? The one underneath the bus or the one on top of the bus? They chose to divide and conquer, which is a good plan. So Severide crawls underneath, starts doing an assessment. He immediately realizes, you know, this guy's talking. He's stuck, but he's breathing. He's able to communicate well, but he's gonna need additional resources and he's gonna need to crib this bus. They got their airbags out, perfect. We actually just did a rescue review on one of our station rigs tours. So if you have an opportunity to see that, go ahead and look at that. But in that rescue, they have airbags. And these airbags are designed to lift very heavy vehicles. The one from Alert actually has an airbag that's big enough to lift train cars. So it's not unrealistic to have an airbag that can lift a bus like this. So they start cribbing it and they start airbagging it to lift it off the patient to give them room to get out. You don't need a whole lot of room, just enough to move. So they're not completely removing the bus, but they are getting it up off that patient. Perfect work. Meanwhile, Casey's on the other side, starts assessing the driver and realizes right away that she's having a seizure and she's unresponsive. At that moment in time, her Glasgow Calma Scale is probably three, maybe four. Glasgow Calma Scale is a way to measure the severity of a patient. You're looking for, are they verbal? Are they obeying commands? Are they moving extremities to your commands? And you rate it as such. It's from basically three is the lowest. You could be dead and have a three as high as 15. So it's a, a perfect way to, to determine how sick your patient is. So Casey immediately realizes that this patient's pretty sick and calls over the medic. Meanwhile, they're working simultaneously underneath the bus, getting it cribbed, we're stabilized, and getting an airbag lifted. Notice they crib as it goes up here. They're cribbing as you're raising. So if for any reason that airbag lets loose, or you blow a line or something happens, that thing's just not, boom, falling back down and hitting the patient or squishing your guy. They're cribbing it as it goes up. Good work, guys. At this moment in time, he calls for additional assistance to try to get him underneath. So he needs another fire guy. He can't move him himself. So the initial firefighter that comes over to assist him is pretty large. You know, he, he's not a small guy. And so he tries to get underneath there with Severide and just simply can't. He's physically too big, whether it's because of his bunker coat, his helmet, whatever. He's too big to get underneath there. And that's one thing that we have to understand in the fire service and EMS. We have multiple size people. You don't just need huge meatheads to pick up things and move things because they're not gonna fit in spaces. You need those little people. So in this scenario, we actually call over kid to get underneath the truck because she's much smaller. They have the same set skill set to do their job. So it, it's not a pride thing. It's not, he couldn't do the job. It's just simply he wouldn't fit. So having a diversified department with 
big, medium, and small people is uh, very important to have a successful rescue. Meanwhile, Casey's working on the outside of the bus here. He takes out the windows. Those are safety windows, so they do come out fairly easy. Usually it's a little latch. Speaking of that, buses are everywhere. They're all across America. I, I, they're in other countries. It's very important for a fire department and EMS crew to practice on these buses. Know how those windows come out. Do they just pop out or do you need to cut a certain hinge? It appeared in this video that they needed to cut a hinge to get that window out, but it gives you pretty good access. The other question is, how do I turn that bus off? Many of them are from the back. You flip up a trap door and there's a switch back there. You can turn not only the bus off, but you can actually shut the gas off and all kinds of other stuff. So take the time, do your pre-plans with those services in your area to know how these buses operate. How do you open the door from the outside uh, if that driver is incapacitated like this one, how do you open that big door? Or can you even open that big door? Almost immediately, here is kind of where I start to have a little bit of trouble with the EMS side. She calls for Versed. Versed is a benzo, so it is gonna be appropriate for seizure activity. But my question is, being in the state that this patient is, did that EMS get a set of vital signs? Respiratory rate, pulse rate, or anything like that. You know, were they able to get a blood pressure? Did they even try to get a blood pressure? You know, you have a little bit of time here. You have access to them through that window. So slow your roll down just a little bit. She gave me an injection through clothing. Out of my years of experience, going through clothing is usually just in TV and movies. We want to expose. You can get to an arm, use your scissors, get to a leg or whatever you can to give that. Now she decided to go IM because she didn't have an IV available to give that. It's a good call because she, it, it's gonna be a rapid extrication, but she wanted to stop that seizure. Being a partner with your fire department and your EMS is key. If you notice their communication between Casey and the medics, they're communicating very, very well. So good things there. It's time to move the patient. So underneath the bus, we have a couple of different options. They chose to go with a backboard. In the old days, I would say even you know five, six, eight years ago, we used backboards quite a bit. Nowadays, they are literally used for just moving patients. But you're in a confined space kind of area, getting a backboard underneath that patient can be difficult. You have just enough room to get them to move forward and backward. Can you roll that patient to get the backboard underneath? If not, how do you get a backboard underneath them? Personally, I probably would have called for a scoop stretcher because now you have a provider on one side and the other side, and that scoop stretcher is a movable device where you can unclip it, clip from one side, go down to the feet, clip the other side, and then move it just like a backboard, but you don't have to roll that patient to get them on to get them centered. So I'm not quite sure. They didn't really show it here how they got them on the backboard. I assume they just kind of scoot underneath them. Personally, I probably would have went with a scoop stretcher or, you know, we even have a tool called the CAD. Not many people remember that thing. We don't use it a whole lot. Using a CAD on the upper part of the body probably be a little bit easier than even a, a backboard because once you have that CAD on, you don't have to do the head straps, but get the CAD underneath, put the straps across the front. You have handles you can pull on and really get that victim out and still keep them in manual stabilization. You have the C-collar on, which you're worried about because of that mechanism of injury, but now you can actually slide that patient out. It worked for them good you know it's monday morning quarterback we know that but just think there are more options there are more tools in your toolbox when you're thinking of an incident like this so as they're bringing out the guy from underneath the bus in the camera view that we see from the top you see that actually the bus door open it's the bigger where you just kind of walk in like if you're going to pay to get in that door's open so i'm not quite sure why they decided later as the rescue goes along to take the driver out of the driver's side window it could be because maybe that bus stop hood was in and they couldn't gain access. I don't know. Obviously, they don't show us the inside of the bus. But if you have a door open, we forget a lot of times just to try the door. Before we start cutting, before we start breaking windows, before we start doing that kind of stuff, do the basics. If a door's open, open it. You know, use the handles. I love this episode, by the way. This is you know, a lot of good work, a lot of communication, very fast. So we'll say he's blocked off from getting inside. So he climbs through the window. Gets in, puts a C collar on the driver, and start loading her onto a stretcher. Again, this is kind of old school. This is season seven of Chicago Fire. They're putting her right onto a backboard. We don't necessarily do that anymore, but it's not wrong if you do, because if you have to move her somehow, that's okay. They bring her out, medics do a reassessment. 
They make sure that she's breathing. Yep, they take the minute right then and there. They take that minute. They look at her. She's still not responsive. She's now got five of her set on board. Her seizing appears to be have stopped. So they can do the work in the truck, but they make sure that she's breathing, she's got a pulse, and then they start moving. Excellent work. So together they move her out, in case she comes out. And that's pretty much it for the end of this rescue. They did a lot of work very quickly. They don't really talk about the EMS box, but if you look in the end of the video, they got one, two ambulances already on scene to take care of those walking wounded. The triage did well, the company did well. Perfect scenario. It's an excellent way to learn. Keep on watching. Once again, this is Heroes Next Door. Thank you for watching. If we've met your expectations, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification, and we look forward to you on the next videos. Thank you.